The other thing I just wanted to note is that, you know, as I've been circulating around, uh, people have, have said to me, so, so what, what about, you know, what after this conference? What, why are you doing this conference? I mean, it's a really interesting subject. We know you're interested in it, but like what comes next? And, and our feeling at MAPC is that we always like to be, if we can, at the leading edge of the technical assistance that we provide, both in land use planning and in public policy on the local level and on the municipal level. Uh, the Secretary mentioned the move to the cities. To us, the move to the cities has a particular definition. Moving to the cities to me means in part you know, more people wanting to live in the core, in Boston, in Cambridge, in Somerville, et cetera. It also means the revitalization of smaller cities like Everett and Quincy and Salem and Gloucester all over our region. And it also means that in many of our wonderful suburban communities, there is an increased interest in living near a village center, near a commuter rail, sa near a commuter rail station, and in areas that have a more urbanized and mixed-use feel. So move to the city is not a simple phenomenon, but it is an important phenomenon that's going on throughout our region and, in fact, throughout America. In every one of those cases, whether it's the urban core, a gateway city, or an urban village in a suburban setting, parking has an influence on that change, that move. And it's important for us to figure out what are the next steps we take in terms of zoning, in terms of financial incentives, in terms of charging for parking, in terms of building state-funded infrastructure. What are the steps we take to try and make sure that our parking regime actually is in service of our land use objectives and not the other way around? And that, I think, is what we're going to try and take from this conference. All the ideas we hear, all the people we meet, to try to bring those into our technical assistance to our cities and towns, to try and bring those into our advocacy with the administration and with the legislature and with our federal partners. That's the agenda that starts today. It doesn't end today. So I just wanted to make sure that people understood that and that this is an opening of the door for discussion on this topic, not kind of a one-off deal with, the, with this conference today. Uh, we are blessed to have uh, so many wonderful speakers and presenters at the breakout sessions and at the plenary sessions, but I am very excited and honored to introduce our next speaker. Uh, Stephanie Pollack is, I believe, the Associate Director of the Dukakis Center for Urban and Regional Policy at uh, Northeastern University. Uh, many of you know that she served for many years at the Conservation Law Foundation doing wonderful environmental work that was really focused on cities, particularly. And uh, around the time, I think you went to Northeastern, around the time I went to MAPC, maybe only a year or so apart. And Stephanie has been a close partner with MAPC uh, in so many ways uh, since that, uh, since that uh, transition in both of our lives. And um, the, the focus of much of Stephanie's work right now is on transportation, sustainability, and equity. And so you know, almost when we have any topic that we're holding a conference on, we can find a way to shoehorn that general interest into the topic of the day and call upon Stephanie Pollack to uh, give us six different ways to look at that that we didn't think of before. So it's my pleasure to introduce Stephanie to all of you today. As Mark said, I'm frequently called upon to talk about a lot of things, and if you know me, you know that I tend not to be intimidated by those. But when my friends at MAPC called me and said, we're going to have a conference on parking, and we're going to bring Donald Shoup in, and he's going to do the morning plenary, and then you get to do the next plenary, I was completely intimidated. <laughs> I'm still completely intimidated. Because I don't do any research on parking. I read a lot of research on parking. I'm going to try to bring some of the most recent stuff that's interesting to me to your attention, because maybe it'll help you. But I don't do it. My history with the parking issue dates back to a time that was mentioned uh, in this morning's panel, a time when the city of Cambridge was not as progressive as it is today on parking issues. And the city had a parking freeze. 
and a developer who didn't want to get a permit under the parking freeze sued the city of Cambridge. And so the city, and I was a young lawyer at the Conservation Law Foundation, and the city came up with a brilliant legal strategy. The strategy was, we won't defend the parking freeze. That way, no one before the judge will be in favor of the parking freeze. The developer doesn't want there to be one, we don't want there to be one, and the parking freeze will disappear. So I ended up intervening in the case so that someone was standing in front of the judge saying, you know, parking supply management is a, a pretty important thing under the Clean Air Act. And um, for my troubles, at an, in an era in which the Cambridge City Council was always divided 5-4, uh, over everything, mostly mostly rent control actually, but pretty much everything. Um, there was a unanimous vote of the Cambridge City Council, nine to nothing, uh, chastising me personally and the Conservation <laughs> Law Foundation for daring, daring to interfere in the important work of parking policy in the city, which I proudly had on my wall uh, at the Conservation Law Foundation for the remainder of my years there. So my perspective on parking is really the, the one that was sort of mentioned in this morning's uh, panel that followed Professor Shoup's planner, which is it's a really political issue, right? And there's not very much that I can add I in this sort of half hour that I'm going to spend talking to you to the how to deal with parking issue. What I want to actually do to sort of deal with my intimidation at having Professor Shub sitting right in front of me is to talk about a different question. This is a technique we professors use, right? If, you, if you're not sure, just change the question and then no one can say you're talking about the wrong thing. So I don't, I don't want to talk about how to deal with parking. That's what the plenary was for this morning. That's what the workshops. I'm going to try to help you when you go back to your cities and towns answer a much more fundamental question and a much more political question which is, why bother? Because honestly, it is a political nightmare for any elected official to tackle the issue of parking. And so if we don't have a better reason than you've got it wrong, we're not going to get parking changed. Because honestly, we get a lot of public policy wrong. And it doesn't get changed because it's wrong, right? It gets changed because there's an upside to doing the hard political work that the city of Cambridge has done, that Mayor Curtitone did in Somerville when he put you know, the on-street residential parking, that the mayor did in Salem. This is hard work. So what's in it for your community? That's actually what I want to talk to you about um, for a while, and then hopefully we can have more of a conversation about that. So um, I really do want to answer this question of how can we convince cities and towns to do smarter parking? And there's this famous saying in public policy, which is, which is what I actually teach at Northeastern, which is most people don't think about policy most of the time. And honestly, most people don't think about parking most of the time. In fact, we probably collectively represent, you know, several percent of all the people in Massachusetts who would spend a whole day at a conference on parking, right? <laughs> So our job is to go back to our colleagues and our neighbors and be able to explain to them who aren't willing to spend their time at a conference on parking, why should they actually care about what's going on in the world of parking, right? So the first question for me is, how do we talk about parking, right? In, in policy, there's this idea of reframing policy issues, talking about them differently, right? So parking has, hist as people trying to change parking policy like Professor Shoup, talk about parking as an economics issue. And it is an economics uh, issue, and there's certainly an economics case for policy change, but I think it's probably more important to talk about the economic case for policy change, right? What's in it for fiscal, policy at the municipal and state level. And so one of the most important documents that there is out there, I mean, Jeanette Sadekan did amazing work on a lot of issues as commissioner in New York, but maybe the most important work she did was develop a set, a, a program called Measuring the Streets, where she didn't just, you know, take parking away and close streets and create bike lanes and create parks, she measured the economic impact of those measures before or after. She found ways to compare neighborhood retail in a place where she'd made changes to neighborhood retail in an otherwise identical neighborhood and say, are they selling more? Are we collecting more sales tax? Is there more foot traffic? So I'm going to use some data because I think it's really important to be able to make the case that the things we're talking about doing are actually going to generate more revenue to businesses in our communities and more tax revenue for our state in the form of sales tax and for our communities, okay? 
The other thing that I just want to briefly mention is there is a fairness case for policy change. And one of the projects that the Dukakis Center and the uh, MAPC have been working together on is a set of regional tracking indicators to help us understand the sustainability of our transportation system. And as we track those, the bottom graph shows you um, a very interesting number, which is out of every thousand people who are 16 or older in the state, how many have a driver's license? Not a car, because owning a car is no longer the same thing as using a car, right? That's what car sharing has changed forever. So we can't just look at zero car households and say they're the folks without cars because more and more of them actually have some access. But people who don't have driver's licenses, they really don't have access to any form of transportation other than a car or getting a ride. And that number is dropping, and it appears to be dropping at both ends of the age spectrum, 16 and 17 and 18 year olds not rushing to get licenses, older uh, uh, members of our community who are trying to live in places where they can give up that driver's license and still live an independent lifestyle. So statewide, about three in 10 residents are too young, too old, too poor, too disabled to get a driver's license. And out of fairness, a parking policy that assumes that 100% of what matters is for people who have a car isn't fair. And, and I would also note, and this is also MAPC data that we're using, it's not just Boston and Cambridge and Somerville where there are substantial numbers of households without cars. Across the state, 10, 15, 20% of the households in communities across the state of Massachusetts don't have a car. And so we owe them both a transportation and a land use policy that doesn't just assume that the most important physical space that we set aside is only for those who are automobile users. And in fact, our current policy requires the construction of more parking spaces when we build housing than there are people living in that housing with cars. Today, I'm not talking about let's change minimum parking requirements for housing in the future in order to induce people to give up cars. I'm talking about this lovely MAPC data, which is actually part of the 37 billion mile data challenge, which I am looking forward to judging, um, and which is currently underway, which shows that in every neighborhood in Boston and in substantial numbers of communities across Massachusetts, the minimum amount of parking that they are required to build for residences exceeds the current average number of cars owned per household. So we're actually making developers build parking spaces for non-existent cars. That should be reason enough to get parking policy changed, but the truth is it's not, because we've known that we get the pricing wrong for a long time, and I think even the fairness argument is not getting as much traction as someone like me who focuses on equity would like. So I thought just to sort of try a new approach, that I would talk today about the physics of parking. What do I mean by the physics of parking? So if you go back literally to Aristotle, and as recently as Einstein, there's this rule. No two objects can occupy the same space at the same time. Now, I have to note, because this is a Boston Cambridge audience, that my uh, high school senior, who's gonna go to Princeton and probably study physics, says to me this morning when we were talking about this, that's not true in quantum physics. That's only true for ordinary matter. So. I will preface my remarks by noting that if anyone in the Boston innovation economy invents a quantum car, <laughs> this theory won't work. But let's stick with ordinary matter. Okay, so no two objects can occupy the same space at the same time. What does that have to do with parking? Well, for most people, they think that what that has to do with parking is we need more of it because no two objects can occupy the same parking space at the same time. But that's actually not the issue that we should be trying to address in many of our communities. The issue would be that we should be trying to address is the fact that because no two objects can occupy the same space, the amount of space we devote to parking that's not even being used is absurd. Because that space, not a space full of cars, but a space built for cars but not used for cars, whether that is on a street, in a surface parking lot or, God forbid, in a structured parking garage. And we have structured parking garages with empty spaces in them 
all over the state because of minimum parking requirements, because of policies like, and I have many friends at the T, but the one for one replacement requirement for when you build on a MBTA parking lot that you have to replace them all, even if you don't need them, means that there are unused parking spaces sitting around. So we have these unused spaces and that space can't be something else. So the interesting conversation that we should be having in our communities is not should we change parking policy, but are there better things we could be doing with the space that we currently devote to on and off street parking because otherwise, why, otherwise it, it can't be. And the thing that sort of prompted me to think about this kind of physics theory of parking is this wonderful website, which if you haven't seen, you should go to called Graphing Parking. And it's this parking wonk person who collects minimum parking requirements, but then he depicts them in relationship to the amount of space that the parking serves. So this is office space, and it shows that the median amount of parking required for office space across all these different cities in the United States occupies almost as much room as the office space itself. So in other words, if you don't have the parking, you can literally build twice as much office space. This is, I thought you guys would like this one, cities and towns, always looking for spaces for schools, right? So you could put a classroom of 35 children in the amount of parking that we require our high schools to build uh, in, across the United States. Same thing is true for housing. So the point of these graphs to me is that all that space that could be high school classrooms or playing fields or people's homes or more offices or more shops or as I'll talk about in a minute more public space isn't. It's parking and it's actually a lot of it is parking we don't even need. So we need to have a conversation about how much parking we need, but we also really need to get at this issue of why public policy is driving parking that we don't use, and therefore, what else could we use with that space, right? And so one of, my, one of our friends who's here from MIT joining us today has pointed out that, you know, if you kind of, we don't know how much parking there is in the United States. Some people say there's as few as 100 million spaces. Some people say there's as many as 2 billion parking spaces which means it's either like the size of Connecticut and, Del Connecticut and Vermont combined, or it's only the size of Rhode Island and Delaware combined. It's a lot of parking. It's a lot of space. So that's what I actually want to talk about for the next few minutes, which is this issue of how do you have a conversation, not about parking as parking or parking as transportation, but parking as space. And parking as what could happen in your community if you suddenly said, we're going to free up some of that space that we're currently devoting to both on and off street parking. What could we put there? Well, we could put public spaces there. We could make room for complete streets. Anyone who's tried to work on complete streets or bike lanes or, bro or wider sidewalks in a community knows that you pretty frequently bump into on-street parking because that's kind of what's there now. Uh, and if you can't sort of nudge that out of the way, you can have beautiful pictures with lovely cross sections drawn, but you don't get them built. And most importantly, we can put more economic development activity. We can build more homes. We can build more shops. We can build more offices there. And if we do those things, then the thing that our communities get, the reason for having this really politically difficult conversation, is not to talk about parking. It's actually to talk about, can we be generating more tax revenue? Could we be providing more public space in our community and in some of our densely populated communities, that's hard to come by, could we be generating more economic activity? And if we start, if we sort of flip the means and the ends in that way, and we say what we want is a community conversation around how to build our community out in the future to have the right mix of economic activity and public space and enough tax revenue to support the things we want to do, if that's the end, and changing parking policy is just a means to that end, I think the conversation will be more successful than if the policy end is actually changing parking policy. So what would that look like? I wanted to kind of highlight for you some examples from around the country on how smarter parking is creating better communities that in most cases have nothing to do with transportation or parking policy. So the five examples that I want to kind of touch on are increasing economic activity and tax revenue by changing parking policy, making room for public space, uh, enabling complete streets to come to fruition, 
revitalizing neighborhood shopping districts, and making housing more affordable. Now, if I showed most communities this slide without the heading and just said we should talk about these five things, you could get a lot of people in most communities to come and talk about these five things, right? So don't tell them that we're going to do it in the context of parking, right? Just tell them, let's talk about these five things. These are really important in our community, right? Okay, so the next couple slides are going to show you are data from a very interesting set of studies that have been done over a period of years by uh, two, two folks, uh, Norman Garrick and Chris McCahill. Uh, they were both at the University of Connecticut. Chris has recently moved on to the State Smart Transportation Institute. And what they did is they sort of picked a set of cities, sort of 100,000-ish sized cities, that they could collect data on actually going back to the 1960s. And they sort of looked at the economic trajectory of those cities as well as their parking. And Cambridge was one of those cities, so was Arlington. Um, but so, and so, and they're mostly New England actually, not all of them. And so New Bedford, uh, New Haven and Hartford were also on their list. And what you see is, is that the cities that had um, that changed direction, the ones on the bottom, where they started to level off the amount of parking that they were devoting space to, were getting better economic returns. And in fact, they were getting better returns in a lot of different ways, right? So those of us who work on smart growth and sustainability spend a lot, a lot of time thinking about how can we make places denser? Well, the, a 10% decrease in parking resulted in a substantial increase in what they called human density, which was sort of the combined number of jobs and residents in these cities divided by their square footage. So all the things you would want to see happen in a sort of smart growth sustainable world actually happened, granted over decades, but actually happened in the cities that got parking policy right. But even more interestingly, for those of you who have to go convince local elected officials to work on this issue, perhaps the most important finding was that cities are leaving tax revenue, tax revenue on the table when they over-prescribe parking, right? So Hartford, uh, Connecticut, uh, their estimate is, is if if the parking in downtown Hartford were generating the same tax base as the economic activity, instead of the current $50 million in annual parking revenue, they would be making an additional, sorry, instead of the current 75, they'd be making 50 million. So they're leaving two thirds of the parking revenue they could be making on the table. By contrast, Cambridge is leaving some money on the table too, because as was noted, Cambridge has some parking. They're leaving a million dollars in parking revenue on the table against a tax base of $75 million. A far more reasonable investment to make in car access, right? So the Hartfords of the world, which is many of our gateway cities, who are assuming that, boy, if I have more parking, maybe that'll attract more people and they'll come here and they'll drive, they're actually, they have it backwards. The data says their economic health would be better with less parking and more development. So that's the first point. Talking about parking is talking about the fiscal health of cities. The second point, and, and Professor Shute mentioned this morning the idea of parklets, and I love parklets, and this is one the city of Boston did not very far from Northeastern off in Mission Hill, but parklets is like, is like the top of the iceberg of the fascinating things that people are doing around the country to take parking that just isn't that important and turning it into really transformative public spaces, right? So this is a project from Portland, Oregon called DPAVE, okay? And the idea of DPAVE is actually a water sustainability idea, which is less asphalt means less stormwater runoff means more infiltration in the ground. And so they do a lot of conventional stuff like we had here, like the schoolyards project where you kind of dig up some asphalt on the school. But they also look at parking lots where maybe you didn't need it. And so there was a community in South Portland near a church, and the church had a big parking lot because apparently we need, what, like four parking spaces for every three clergymen or three parking spaces for every four clergymen or something like that. And not only was this parking lot a waste of space because it wasn't full even on Sundays, even on Christmas and Easter, it became a bad neighbor to its community because of its emptiness People were dealing drugs in this parking lot. 
kids were, you know, speeding around in this parking lot. So the community decided to work with DPAVE, which is an actual nonprofit, and they took the equivalent of 3,500 square feet of asphalt. Asphalt, not a ton of asphalt in the world of surface parking, and they turned it into uh, this community public space called Our Happy Block, which has over 1,300 native trees and plants, and which diverts millions of gallons of stormwater every year um, off of the streets, right? That's one. Now here's, this is a recent one, one of my favorites. This is a project that the Project for Public Spaces did with the city of Philadelphia. Uh, the area around 30th Street Station in Philadelphia was being rethought. Remember, we're gonna do that with South Station too, so keep this in mind. Um, and there was sort of a, an area that had these big wide sidewalks that actually nobody was making much use of the sidewalks and uh, about 34 parking spaces and two parking lanes that weren't getting used easily. So they turned it into a project called The Porch. And the porch um, has become basically one of the hottest public spaces in the city of Philadelphia. They actually did pre and post conversion use studies and looked at retail activity, visitations, use. Uh, they have, this is my favorite, they do a mini golf course on it. They do a beer garden on it. And it was 34 parking spaces. I'm sorry, this is a better use of land in a city like Philadelphia than 34 parking spaces. Um, and then again, when New York City looked at some of the places where it had similarly taken parking or travel lanes and turned them into public space, they were able to document substantial increases in local economic activity. So again, you get a twofer. You take asphalt, which isn't really accomplishing much as parking, you get public space, and you get increased economic activity and the tax revenue that results. So again, do you start the conversation with parking or do you start the conversation with what the parking could be? Um, a third thing that I wanted to touch on was uh, for, for any of us who have worked, and I, I worked on this issue in my hometown of Newton, so I went on this issue, we all love complete streets. Complete streets is a great idea. We should have more of them. Um, the problem is, is that a street right of way, a significant chunk of many street right of ways is parking. Uh, and if you don't, if you're not willing to take some of the parking away for some of the length of the street, really hard to actually do complete streets. So there's a million examples from around the country, but I, I cite this one in San Francisco on Polk Street because it was one where the city just came out and said, yes, we're taking half of the parking away. We should do that. Here's the data on how many people actually get to Polk Street on transit and on foot and on bikes versus in cars. Here's the data on how many people in this neighborhood don't even own cars. And it is not an appropriate allocation of public space between car owners and non-car owners to have as many parking spaces as we now have. We're going to take some of them away to make room for this complete streets design. And that's the conversation we have to have. Yes, it was a conversation about parking. Yes, it was a conversation about transportation, but it was also a conversation about who are those parkers? How are people getting to the neighborhood? What is gonna happen to the neighborhood if there's less parking there? And are, is that parking really for the people in that neighborhood who aren't car owners or for someone else? Um, similarly, folks are doing interesting thing with parking. So keep some of the parking, but use it to create a protected bike lane. And again, New York looked at that and creating protected bike lanes using parking, not just as a thing where cars sit, but as an actual barrier to create a lower stress bicycling environment is great for the cyclist. It's great for transportation, but it also slows things down in the neighborhood, increases sales taxes and retail activity. So one of the transportation related pieces of the parking conversation in our cities and towns needs to be about this question of what do we want to happen on our streets, which are a substantial part of the public space that's controlled by our cities and towns. And really, you know, it's not about taking all the parking away. And it's not just about pricing the parking, but it's about what do we allocate to parking? How much do we need to allocate to on-street parking? How much do we allocate to other users? Uh, and several of the slides I've raised bring up this issue, and Professor Shoup also used the example of uh, old Pasadena, so I won't talk too much about it, but this idea about, you know, there is an idea that um, merchants have that, they, that local merchants need parking, that parking is the lifeblood of local retail. And it's, 
not actually true. <laughs> There's not a lot of data that says it's true. Um, uh, they don't even actually know how much parking there is. We had a group of students who did a project for uh, uh, West Roxbury uh, Main Streets. Uh, they went around, they talked to all the, uh, the very small local merchants, and they all said there wasn't enough parking, and they you know, walked around and logged how many of the parking spaces were empty, and pretty much all of the on-street parking <laughs> spaces were empty. Um, it was amazing, actually, when the students showed them the data, they said, just it's not true. You know, it's just not true. Those parking spaces are full. And the students came back like eight different days. You know, they said, well, come Tuesday. It's busier Tuesday. Okay, we'll come back on Tuesday. It's not actually any busier on Tuesday. They just, they wouldn't, it, you know, we need more parking. That's what we need. Um, so, so we need to be able to talk to local merchants about the studies that say that pedestrians and cyclists spend 15% more per capita than people who arrive by parking. We need to talk about the possibility of, as old Pasadena did, keeping the parking revenue local, maybe using it to support business improvement districts. We have to talk about the data from New York City on how much sales go up when you do complete streets, do traffic calming, add bike lanes, take away parking and general purpose lanes because there, that misinformation gets in the way of the conversation we need to have, which again isn't take all the parking away or price it at you know, $100 an, uh, an hour, but it is maybe there'll be a little less, maybe we'll price it differently, we'll make sure that whatever part of your business depends on parking and parking turnover, we will accommodate. Another topic that I want to touch on, uh, and I think it will be the last, and then we'll open it up to conversation, is one that Secretary Bialecki raised, which is this issue of housing affordability. The lack of affordable housing, and I don't mean deed-restricted housing affordable to people at 50 or 80 percent of area median income. I mean housing that people can afford. I mean like my daughter who's graduating from college and, getting a, and has a job in Boston as a software developer can afford, and that's not a lot of housing. She's already given up on Boston, and it's only a question of how far she's moving um, from Boston, and that's on a software developer's salary, um, without mommy and daddy helping her. <laughs> um, we're paying for the college part. Um, so I'm talking about attainable housing, affordable housing, housing that we, our kids, our parents, our coworkers can afford to live in. And the truth is that one of the easiest ways to make housing more affordable in an area like ours where construction costs and land costs are always going to be high is to change our attitude towards the amount of parking we provide when we build housing. We can peel much more off the cost of housing by not building as much parking than we can peel by changing standards, shortening permitting by 30 days. I mean, those are all important things. Housing is so expensive here that every single thing we can do to make it less expensive, we should do. But we shouldn't ignore the big things because they're the hard things. And one of the big things is that every time you make a developer build more, more parking than they are actually demanded by their tenants, the non-car owning tenants are subsidizing the cost of the rent or the cost of the purchase of that. And as we said, this is not, not, not about social engineering. This is not about saying let's build less than current populations need to force people to give up their cars. This is about the idea that there is no justification for a minimum parking requirement that exceeds the current level of car ownership. If we could just agree that no community should have a parking minimum that exceeds that current population, how many of them own cars, we would be lowering parking minimums for housing all across Greater Boston. Right? And we're not doing that. Then if we also want to talk about the policy objective of prioritizing non-car owning residents, well, then we can ratchet it down further, right? But those are two separate conversations. So this is one of the studies. There have been a bunch. This is one that Todd Littman pulled together for the Victoria Pu uh, Transportation Institute, where he looked at uh, that if you require one parking space, it ends up representing close to 12% of the cost of building a uh, affordable rental unit, if you require two, it skyrockets to 25% of the cost. The flip side of that is if you take those requirements away, you're reducing the cost by 12 to 25%. Probably one of the best uh, documented tools that's out there is the, what's called the Right Size Parking Program, um, which has been this program 
um, in the city of Seattle that actually looked at over 200 occupied multifamily projects to see what the parking utilization was based on the nature of the parking, its location relative to transit and the street grid, and basically came up with a series of algorithms. And then the city created an online calculator. So if you are now a developer and you are coming in and you are proposing 16 units on a specific parcel, you go into the calculator and it tells you for your kind of project in your location how much parking you need based on actual parking use from these 200 projects that were tracked. And then the city basically gives you a permit for that project based on the amount of parking that the calculator comes up with, not based on the zoning. Okay? This is a completely different idea. And again, it's not about no parking. It's not about pretending that no one has cars or even that nobody who lives in affordable housing have cars. People who live in affordable housing do have cars. They're just less likely to have cars than people who live in market rate housing. And we're not doing them a favor by building them parking spaces for the cars they don't have. So where I want to sort of end and, and leave ourselves some time to talk among ourselves is when you were talking about parking, don't start by talking. In this room, talk about parking all you want. <laughs> we all love it. That's why we're spending the day together. But when you go back to venues where people are not quite as excited about parking as we all are, you might consider starting the conversation about what do we want in our community in terms of economic development, in terms of increasing tax revenues, in terms of exciting new open spaces, in terms of true complete streets in terms of more affordable homes for more different kinds of people to live in, and in terms of supporting our neighborhood merchants. And if the people can get excited about one or any one of those or a combination of those outcomes, then it's our job to educate our neighbors and our colleagues about how changing the way we think about parking can allow us to achieve these goals that we all hold in common for our communities. Thank you very much. I am told people with microphones, and if you have a question, you're supposed to kind of hold it up and they will come to you. There are no questions? There have to be questions because she has all the answers. <laughs> and or I can just refer them to Professor Shoup, so I won't have this opportunity all the time. Okay. okay. I'll give you a question so you have an opportunity to answer it because okay, I know you, you know the answer. I'm Ann Lusk from the Harvard School of Public Health. Thank you for including complete streets. When you talk about economic development, you're talking about money versus car parking. Could you also talk about car parking? versus other forms of transportation as a replacement. Many people love biking, many people love walking, many people love transit, but if they then also don't realize that's another selling point in talking about the parking, they're just gonna think about parking. So when it comes to thinking about a world in which you live without uh, regular access to a car, there are two kinds of people, the ones who actually already live that way and the ones who can't imagine it. Um, and so one, and it's very hard to have a civil conversation between those two groups. So the way I approach this issue, and I, and I said this in, in Newton when I was chairing the, the Transportation Advisory Committee is, I don't actually think of transportation that way, and maybe it's because of my own uh, life and my own family. Most people use different ways of getting around most of the time. There is not a universe of cyclists and a universe of walkers and a universe of transit riders and a universe of drivers. Most people do some of them most of the time. Not everybody cycles, not everybody drives, but many people will use all four of those and many, many people will use two or three. So to me, the conversation is not about privileging the walkers or the bikers over the drivers. It is actually about fairly allocating the ability to get where we need to go to serve everyone's needs. And since I walk some of the times, it's in my interest to make sure that there are 
sidewalks and crosswalks and, and safe times for me to get across the street. And since I actually don't bike that much, but um, I bike occasionally and members of my family bike a lot, um, I like there to be some space for bikers. But honestly, I own a car. My family owns two, five licensed drivers, two cars. It's about the right ratio. Um, and most people do drive. And a lot of people now who don't own cars drive zip cars, right? So, so that conversation is important, the conversation about making room for everybody. And the, by the way, when I say pedestrian walkers and pedestrians, I also mean people who are mobility impaired, who are in wheelchairs. But it's really about allocation. And the thing about parking, honestly, is it's just a space grabber. It's just a, it's a space hog. It takes an immense amount of room for you to take up enough space so that if someone happens to come along who wants to park, they can park there, you know? And that space could be a piece of a wider sidewalk, a piece of a crosswalk, a piece of a bicycle lane, a piece of a parking space for a shared car that 18 or 20 or 25 different households would rely on instead of a parking space just for one family. And that's the conversation I think we have to have. But I think the mistake that gets made is sort of dividing the world into people who use different kinds of transportation and then trying to say which needs are more important than others. They're all important. But all of them are important. We can't just say drivers automatically get this much of space and everybody else fights for the crumbs. Hi, I'm Rachel Stark from Walking in Arlington, which is a pedestrian advocacy group. And the reason why I'm at a parking event is because I don't look at parking and walking as bad parking. I look at it as parking and walking. And this transit riders get their walking and their fitness basically tucked in invisibly to their transportation and tend to be fitter than people who only drive. This could be true of parking if we start doing some of the, you park a whole two, you know, kind of two blocks away. How can we get the doctors and the public health people and the fitness trainers to say, this is a, this is a benefit? Parking two blocks away or four blocks away and walking as a regular thing is a benefit, not a cost. I certainly see that it is. Many people do not. How do we make that into better parking? Oh, I got to walk. How do, how do we do that? So I think that I have sort of two thoughts. So one is this is actually where a lot of what Professor Shoup was saying in the other workshop on pricing comes in, right? Because if we think locationally, that we want to make parking two or three blocks away desirable, pricing is about the best signal we have for indicating that, right? So if we, if you want to, you know, people like to save money, right? This is the, right now they save money by cruising and creating congestion. But if the way you save money if you're a parker and walker person is that parking right near where my destination is costs me more, and parking two or three or four blocks away costs me less or nothing, depending on what the market is like, a certain percentage of people are in fact going to do it. So again, it's not this, you know, nanny state we're telling everybody that they should park four blocks away from the store they're going to and walk four blocks. We can say that all we want. We can have doctors write prescriptions. My husband and brother are doctors, you know, their patients don't listen to them. Uh, or at least that's what they complain about. You want people to, you want to send people a signal that more distant parking is a thing they should use as a matter of public policy, price it differently. That's the first point. The second one, which is more interesting and I hadn't given much thought to, is there's a, co a colleague of mine at Northeastern, Joan Fitzgerald, has been doing a lot of work on eco-districts. And in some of the eco-districts that she has studied in Europe, it's not just that they have reduced the parking requirements for new residential construction. You're not allowed to build parking on site. The parking for the housing development is actually a couple of blocks away, and of course it's priced separately. So, and usually they try to put, you know, the entrance to the parking development right at the light rail stop and right near the shared bike station. And so what they find is even that I have a car, but it's parked a couple blocks away, people walk out the door and they are more likely to just walk hop on a bike or hop on the train, even if their own car is garaged farther. So some of these sort of walkable places that are starting to be in vogue in European cities where you have whole districts in Rome and Amsterdam where you can't own a car and your car is sort of garaged somewhere else, you see a lot more walking activity. And it's not, again, because there's no car. There is a car, but we made it just inconvenient enough that its utilization goes down. And so that's another idea that I don't think is really taking off in this country yet, but it's something to keep in mind. It's not a black and white. It's not 
are there space, you know, is it car free housing or is it housing with X minimum? We could also imagine housing developments with shared parking that was available a few blocks away as a way of either discouraging people from driving or at least encouraging them to take that walk when they get in their car and at the end of the day when they're done. <laughs> this is a quiet group. Most parking groupies are much more, you know, over there. Um, you need to wait for, who's got the other mic? Someone have a mic to bring over to the side? There we go. Hi, well, the walking that you're talking about makes me think about one of the things that I've thought about more and more, especially with the, um, the proliferation of big housing developments, and that is civic life. Because what I see is gated communities that I mean, it's, it's the functional equivalent of a gated community. These are people who just go in their basement and drive out, and they aren't part of the community. And I don't think that benefits them, and it doesn't benefit the people around. And it makes it, I think that that is one of the things that fuels neighborhood opposition to these big buildings, because they're just these aliens plunked down next to your home. Um, and I've talked to people who live in those buildings and they feel cut off. It's not that they're spurning us, it's that the whole structure of it feels cut off. So do you think that there are ways other than what you said of having the parking not be right there, that we can use parking or not parking to spark better, um, better civic life in our neighborhoods? I mean, all of our policy about land use and zoning and parking is ultimately about the kinds of communities we want to live in, right? It's normative. There's values built into it. So interestingly, if we want people in our neighborhoods to interact more with us and with the neighborhood businesses, we shouldn't be afraid of housing developments with no parking in them, yet clearly, a fair number of people in communities like Boston are terrified, right? Because by definition, if you're living in this building, you know, near North Station, and there's not a single parking space in your building, unless you hermetically seal yourself in and get all your groceries and other goods delivered, you will walk out the front door of that building periodically. You will get on the T. You will grab a bite at a nearby restaurant. You will do your shopping. You will be more part of the neighborhood. But what people believe happens in that circumstance is you have a hidden car somewhere <laughs> in the, some secret garage or, God forbid, in an on-street parking space. And, you know, you're just secretly driving everywhere. And so we can't have buildings with no parking. So this is what I said. We have to have this conversation. To me, if we don't want big housing developments to feel like gated communities, then we need to give the people who live in them a necessity for getting out and about. And one of the easiest ways to do that is to ratchet down even to zero the amount of parking we build. But that's not how the conversation about residential buildings without parking goes. Hello, my name's Craig Kelly. I'm also from Cambridge. I think you completely discount the importance of having available on-street parking to people that don't have their own parking. Um, ask any mom with a two-year-old kid that's half asleep, uh, you know, where she's going to put her car when she doesn't have off-street parking, uh, and it's a real problem. And that's one of the things that we have to deal with in tight, crowded spaces. So the idea of bringing in more people with, without an honest discussion, not a, not a sort of joking discussion about the costs of not having access to on-street parking, I think does no one any favors. I don't mean to joke. I thought Professor Shoup actually addressed that issue well. If you're worried about on-street parking in your community, that's exactly what resident-only parking districts are for. If the community feels like we need those spaces because we don't have driveways or we don't have access to enough parking for ourselves, that's exactly when you set up an on-street parking permitting program and you ensure that the limited supply of on-street parking that's available is for the people who already live there and isn't being used by, for example, people who are using a nearby T-station or 
for people who bought, right? In a city like Boston, it's really easy. If you do a development and you exclude the address of the development from the on-street residential parking database, then if somebody shows up and tries to get a permit, they're going to be denied that permit. It's not actually technologically difficult to say, this is truly a no parking project. You cannot park on the street if you buy into this project because when you go to get that little permit, we're not issuing it to you. So it is a soluble problem. I will also say that even in more suburban settings, the idea that you need parking is, still doesn't mean that you have to take you know, a third of the lot and occupy it with giant driveways and, and parking garages. So when I was working on the zoning for a project at the South Weymouth Naval Air Station and we wanted to have the maximum lot size for 2,000 units be 5,000 square feet, a lot of the developments were designed with alley access from the back and no driveways because the driveways took up so much room that you couldn't build a house that was what the market on the South Shore wanted on that lot size. And as soon as you took the p driveway out, not parking, the driveway, so that parking was you pulled around back, then you had lovely townhouses on smaller lots where everybody did have a parking space and the kind of density that we needed to make that walkable and transit served. So I, I, I park, I had three little kids at the same time, I get that. It's not about depriving people, it's about thinking differently about what the solutions are to the problem when there is legitimately a need to park, but not assuming that everybody needs to park all the time. Thank you, Eric. So I'm Mark Drayson again. Stephanie, I have a... Um, a question for you, you might have actually begun to just touch on it in the last answer, but uh, we, uh, we have very varied communities in this metropolitan region, and there are places that have already um, achieved or begun to achieve some of our mixed-use objectives. You can live there without a car, not only because there's transit available, or you can use your car less if you have one, not only because there's transit available, but also because 10 of the things you want to do are in walking distance, as opposed to two of the things you want to do are in walking distance. And um, I don't want our effort to change parking policy to be one that's limited to only those kinds of places. I also want to find a way to make appropriate changes in places where the land use hasn't, caught, caught, hasn't quite caught up with this idea yet. And I wonder if you could speak a little bit about the dichotomy between you know, what we do in Union Square in Somerville and what we do in Framingham or what we do in a smaller community as well. So I think that Mark makes a very important point and I don't think anyone, I certainly am not and I don't think anyone who's here today is saying there's some one size fits all solution to parking. That said, places where it is even possible to imagine retrofitting the urban fabric to allow people to live with either no cars or in some cases, in many cases, what's more likely, which is what we call car light, so sort of one car per family and some sort of shared, shared car nearby, are precious places. And so I promised David Kozis I wasn't going to talk about this, but I'm going to talk about this. When you have a place in your community where it is actually possible to imagine that lifestyle, it is a very valuable opportunity, right? So I live in Newton, and there's a municipal parking lot in Newton that sits next to a commuter rail station and across the street from a full service grocery store, which makes it one of the only places where I really could imagine that you could live in my city, which I love, and have no car at all as long as there were some zip cars there because, you know, the dry cleaners are there and the drug store is there and most importantly, the grocery store is there and the tea is there, right? And, you know, we're five years into a process about what kind of development to put on this poor, beleaguered parking lot and there's a group of people who want to sort of throw the whole process out and start again and one of the things that they keep saying is I can't imagine who would ever want to live in Newton without a car and the answer is that's because there is no place in Newton where you can imagine living without a car we have to make such a place and if my friend Chris Leinberger, who I'm doing a project with right now, we're here. He would say, we've probably built all the detached single family four bedroom colonials we need for a long time. <laughs> so the trick to the housing market is to get those of us occupying them 
into our aging years, like my husband and I who raised, you know, five kids in a 2,000 square foot house. I need to move out of my house and some other lovely family that needs access to the Newton Public Schools should be moving into my house, but I don't want to leave Newton. So either we will build another place in Newton where my husband and I can happily manage a different kind of housing and then someone else will be in my four bedroom house or I'll stay in my four bedroom house just with two of us or by myself as long as I possibly can because I don't want to leave Newton, right? And so this is the conversation. It's not that there are no places, but most communities have places where it's at least possible to imagine creating a little enclave of walkability and of the ability to survive with fewer cars. And once we find those places in our communities, we, do, we really are gonna have to fight the battles um, to invent those places. And they're gonna look really different than the rest of the community, which is gonna make the battle that much harder. But if we don't, right, then, then it is just, well, here's one set of places that are like that and, and here's another that aren't like that. And I, and I don't believe that has to be true. I think we have wonderful main streets and town centers and village centers and communities all over that could be very different places that used to be very different places with substantial residential uh, populations and we need, to, we need to find them and focus on them. Okay, Jess is telling me my time is over. So Mark gets the last question. Um, and is there like a logistics announcement for the next set of workshops? Okay. Okay, so um, thank you all for your attention.